Good day. My name is Louis Rousseau and I'm a portfolio manager with AdviceWorks Private Client Securities. I'd like to spend the next quarter of an hour talking to you about the global COVID-19 pandemic and the impact that it's having on investment markets. I'd also like to share some thoughts with you on how AdviceWorks sees the way forward. The week's big international news was the violent confrontation between Jews and Arabs in Israel. The conflict started with demonstrations by Palestinians in Jerusalem against Israel's planned eviction of Palestinian families from the old city and was aggravated when security forces stormed the Al-Aqsa Mosque using tear gas and stun grenades against worshippers whom Israel claims were acting in a provocative manner. Hamas militants retaliated by firing barrages of rockets into Israeli cities from the Gaza Strip, to which the Israeli Defense Force responded with airstrikes on Gaza. So far, more than 2,000 rockets have been launched by Hamas, with the majority being intercepted by Israel's Iron Dome anti-missile system, as can be seen in this photograph. As of Friday night, nearly 163 million people have been infected with COVID-19 worldwide and 3.37 million people have now succumbed to the disease. The United States remains hardest hit with 33.7 million infections reported and 599,000 deaths. India, Brazil, France and Turkey now make up the rest of the top five and South Africa is still in 20th position in terms of the most recorded cases. The average number of daily new COVID cases in the world declined significantly over the past week from more than 800,000 per day to just over 700,000. Most of this decline is due to a sharp drop in reported new infections in India, where the government has belatedly introduced a strict lockdown in most of the country. It is concerning to note that new cases are on the rise in Brazil and Argentina, as well as in Japan, where the Olympic Games are due to be held in two months' time. The daily death toll also fell this week from more than 14,000 to around 12,500. Much of the decline is due to substantial reductions in daily deaths in India and Brazil. Skeptics argue that this is due to underreporting rather than success in treating patients, as many people in these two countries die at home and are never tested or autopsied. Colombia and Iran are experiencing sharp rises in fatalities, but the good news is that the daily new infections in both have plateaued, which should result in a lower death rate by the end of the month. Vaccination programs are gaining momentum in many countries, with South Africa sadly being one of the exceptions. By Friday evening, 1.41 billion people, that is just over 18% of mankind, had received at least one dose of vaccine. 367 million of them were Chinese. The United States was in second place with 267 million, followed by India with 178 million and Britain with 55 million. The United States now has 119 million people fully vaccinated, followed by India with 39 million, Britain with 19 million, and Brazil with 16 million. China does not provide this figure, but based on the types of vaccines used there, it can be assumed that about 160 million Chinese are now fully vaccinated. Despite disappointing employment and retail sales numbers, Producer price inflation and consumer price inflation both accelerated in the United States during April. China is also experiencing higher inflation, but at least enjoyed a surge in foreign direct investment over the past four months. Because of the oil production cuts decreed by OPEC+, Saudi Arabia's GDP has now been in recession for more than a year. There is growing agitation that the Tokyo Olympics should be postponed or cancelled altogether, and Nicola Sturgeon's nationalists are demanding another referendum on Scottish independence after they won last week's election. After strong growth during the first quarter, 
500,000 fewer jobs were created in America during April than in March. The main reason for this decline was not a lack of vacancies, but rather a shortage of people with the requisite skills to fill them. Many low-skilled jobs were lost forever during the pandemic, while many of the new opportunities becoming available require at least some technical know-how. The poor job numbers, combined with inflation fears, have since led to a significant decline in U.S. consumer confidence. There has long been a strong correlation between commodity prices and inflation expectations, which is understandable since raw materials make up a large component of producer price inflation, which in turn is a leading indicator of future consumer price inflation. This graph depicts the recent simultaneous rises in the Bloomberg Commodities Index, that is the blue line, and the Federal Reserve's Inflation Expectations Index, the white line. No wonder consumers are bracing themselves for higher inflation and interest rates. In a previous presentation, I argued that governments should use the imperative to stimulate their economies during the pandemic in a far-sighted way by not simply putting money in people's pockets, but to do so in a way that contributes to the fight against climate change. This infographic shows the extent to which a number of countries have done so. The percentage of GDP spent on stimulus is shown on the horizontal axis and the percentage of this spending allocated to greening the economy on the vertical. France, Germany and Scandinavia scored well on both counts, while Turkey, Switzerland and Canada have been pro-green but spent relatively little. Countries like China, Japan and South Korea spent a lot but with little attention to greening. The United States, Israel and Austria were among those who spent relatively little and with a low proportion allocated to the green economy. One of the key drivers of China's rapid industrial development was its abundant cheap labor. This infographic shows how the Chinese Communist Party's controversial one-child policy has all but wiped out this demographic dividend. The graph on the top left shows how aborting female babies has increased the relative size of the male population thereby reducing the population's growth potential. On the top right, we see how the population is aging, while the three graphs in the bottom half show the dramatic reduction in population growth since 1980, and how households have shrunk and become more urbanized. In short, China is on its way to resembling the demographic profile of today's Japan over the coming decades. Fear gripped the world's markets for four days this week before optimism and greed returned on Friday when it appeared as if the U.S. economy would not overheat after all. Chinese markets remain depressed due to a combination of interest rate fears and government crackdowns on big technology companies. The U.S. dollar rallied for most of the week but then fell on Fed pronouncements that rates were unlikely to rise anytime soon. Gold did well as a consequence, and iron ore reached a new record high on Wednesday. The oil price also seesawed, but ended the week slightly higher. Global equity markets endured a poor week, with the exception of bourses in mainland China. The Taiwan weighted was the worst performing major index, weighed down by the general gloom as well as by the current bellicose stance of China towards Taiwan. Perhaps unsurprisingly, the A50 and Taiwan weighted were top and bottom for the past month as well. The CAC40 in Paris is the new best performer for the year to date, and the A50 the worst. Over 12 months, the Russell 2000 still reigns supreme, with Hong Kong's Hang Seng the wooden spoonest. The Nasdaq and Hang Seng are top and bottom for the past three years. Commodity markets also spent the week in the doldrums, with most counters in the red, and only coal significantly higher. Gold continued to edge upwards and is now nearly out of the red for the year to date. Iron ore and cobalt were top and bottom over the past month, with lithium still way ahead for the year to date. 
A huge surplus on markets continues to dog the three battery metals, lithium, cobalt, and nickel. This infographic shows how the advent of renewable energy has changed the market for commodities. Copper, the blue bar, has seen a massive surge in its application, both via electric vehicles and solar and wind power. Nickel, lithium, cobalt and graphite are the key components of electric vehicle batteries, while zinc and silicon are indispensable in the clean power field. The so-called rare earth metals like scandium, yttrium and lanthanum are also becoming invaluable to both the renewable energy and technology sectors. An aphorism mistakenly attributed to President John F. Kennedy claims that a rising tide lifts all boats. In the world of investment management, this translates into a belief that passive or index investing will do just as well or better than active fund management during a bull market. As depicted in this infographic, actively managed mutual funds, the gray bars, have battled to attract inflows, while ETFs, the brown bars, which typically track indices, have ballooned. Although I have nothing against exchange-traded funds and sometimes use them as well for specific purposes, I would like to remind viewers of another aphorism often attributed to Warren Buffett. Only when the tide goes out do you learn who's been swimming naked. We remain positive about global equities. Corporate earnings continue to grow in the current low interest rate environment. U.S. price-to-earnings ratios are looking stretched, but equity earnings yields remain more attractive than bond yields. Pan-Europe offers better value, but the most attractive valuations are to be found in Japan and emerging markets, including China. We are, however, keeping an eye on what happens to inflation and interest rates and will react if they take a turn for the worse. For now, we remain underweight global bonds, as yields remain unattractive and, if mandated to invest in bonds, we prefer emerging market bonds over those of developed markets. We retain a neutral weighting with regard to global property. Our least favoured sectors are retail and office property because e-commerce and work from home could do long-term damage to their profitability. Conversely, these two trends are positive for the industrial and residential property sectors. The hospitality sector should recover in due course, but only once vaccinations have achieved critical mass. Here at home, the struggle for the soul of the ANC keeps intensifying. This week, the party's leadership condemned Secretary General Ace Mahashule's attempt to suspend President Ramaphosa, and ordered Mahashule to apologize publicly or face further sanction. In response, he filed court papers in an attempt to have his own suspension declared unconstitutional and dared the ANC to expel him. The ANC top six will be meeting on Monday to discuss its response to this development. As of Friday night, more than 1.6 million South Africans have tested positive for COVID-19 and 55,000 people have succumbed to the virus. The number of infections and deaths per day has been steadily rising, and on Friday, 112 people died of the disease. Amid growing fears over a third wave, government is launching the second phase of its vaccination program this week, which will focus on vaccinating senior citizens. By Friday night, 474,000 people or 0.8% of the population had been vaccinated. According to ratings agency Moody's, South Africa's credit rating remains sub-investment grade, and our manufacturing and mining sectors fared much better than a year ago in March, admittedly off a very low base. Both main purchasing managers' indices were positive in April, but ESCOM's maintenance and restoration program saw power output decline in the first quarter. The South African Post Office feels it deserves kudos for losing 11% of the parcels it handles, and it is now official. Spectators will not be allowed at rugby matches against the British and Irish Lions. 
The COVID pandemic has done immense damage to the global economy, not least to global trade. Commodity exporting countries also endured their share of the pain. Everyone shared in the initial downturn, but the recent surge in industrial metals and minerals has benefited some countries more than others. Over the past three years, the three top performing commodity exporting countries in the global south have been Australia, South Africa and Brazil, thanks to their diversified blends of mining and agricultural commodity exports. The RAND is a structurally weak currency, meaning that over the long term, our relatively high inflation and poor credit rating will cause it to depreciate against the currencies of developed economies. Because South Africa has a relatively high propensity to import, the weakening of the RAND caused so-called imported inflation. This graph illustrates the strong correlation between the RAND dollar exchange rate, the blue line, and South African consumer price inflation, the brown line. It is interesting to note how the correlation has reduced in recent years to the extent that the Reserve Bank now estimates that a 1% depreciation adds only 0.1% to the CPI rate compared to as much as 0.25% a decade ago. South Africa is still classified as a middle-income country, but we've been getting relatively poorer as a nation over time. This graph shows how serious this decline has become. It compares the median personal wealth in dollars of South Africa, the blue line, with the world, the brown line. As recently as 2007, the typical South African was worth double the median for the world. By 2017, we were overtaken and the gap keeps widening. In my view, it is not a coincidence that this process of unraveling started around the same time as the ANC's Polokwane conference, where the Zuma faction seized power. The JSE spent most of the week on the back foot and ended down 3.7%, with only the financial index in positive territory. The bond market ended slightly weaker, and the RAND stood its ground against the US dollar. NASPERS and PROCESS plan a share swap, which will have the effect of increasing the PROCESS free float by half, and lure shares rose strongly on excellent results. Clicks and Pick and Pay are seeking Competition Commission approval for Clicks to buy out Pick and Pay's in-store pharmacies, and South African Airways is out of business rescue and hopes to resume flights before the end of July. Last but not least, Sun International is making a huge investment in its property portfolio in the city formerly known as Port Elizabeth. Last week, foreigners were net sellers of South African equities, but net buyers of South African bonds. The JSE saw an outflow of just over 3 billion rand, while the bond exchange enjoyed an inflow of 8.25 billion rand. For the year to date, the JSE is down nearly 14 billion rand from a foreign inflow perspective, while the bond exchange has lost nearly 32 billion rand. Two of the biggest challenges facing NASPERS have always been the company's massive share in the JSE's market capitalization and its huge discount to its net asset value. As a consequence, it listed part of its empire as process in an attempt to unlock shareholder value. Since then, NASPERS' share price has risen to such an extent that its value relative to the rest of the JSE is once again similar to before the process listing and its discount to net asset value is bigger than before. The two companies now plan to increase the process stake in NASPERS to 49.5% through a share swap, which will have the effect of reducing the NASPERS weighting in the SWIX index from 23% to 15% and doubling the process free float. The US dollar is once again in downward mode after strengthening against most global currencies earlier in the week. The RAND ended the week at levels of around 14 Rand 10 per dollar, which is where it was two years ago. The RAND, represented by the dark blue line, remains one of the strongest emerging market currencies over the past year, 
along with the Indonesian rupiah, the gray line, and the Mexican peso, the purple line. If one uses purchasing power parity, the dark blue line, as a guide to what the rand should be worth relative to the dollar in future, the rand dollar exchange rate, the dark green line, should currently be around 14 rand 20 per dollar. The local currency is therefore almost exactly at fair value to the greenback. Given its long-term tendency to depreciate by 5% or more per year over time, it is unlikely to strengthen dramatically from its current levels. It might in fact weaken later this year. We remain slightly underweight South African equities relative to our long-term strategic asset allocation. Domestic equities look cheap relative to offshore equities, both in developed markets and emerging markets, as well as relative to the JSE's own historical average price to earnings ratio. Despite the apparent value they offer, local equities remain hamstrung by the weak domestic economy and uncertainty over government's economic policy intentions. Despite the sharp recovery in the prices of some domestic listed property counters, we remain worried over the sector's long-term outlook and heavy debt burden. We therefore avoid property until the outlook changes materially. Domestic bonds remain our preferred local asset class. Yields remain highly attractive, and although we remain concerned over the long-term outlook for South Africa's government finances, we believe that a substantial risk premium is already factored into bond prices and yields. We prefer government inflation-linked bonds at the shorter end of the yield curve and nominal bonds higher up the curve. We are wary of corporate credit, however. It looks both risky and expensive. The AdviceWorks asset allocation view can be summarized as follows. We remain overweight global equities because of the greater opportunity set they offer and our long-term concerns over the structural vulnerability of the RAND. We are gradually adding to our local equity allocation and remain neutral on global property. We still avoid local property because of the uncertainty over the long-term health of the sector and hold no global bonds unless specifically mandated to do so. We are also maintaining our tactical overweight position in local bonds. Thank you very much for your time and attention. We certainly live in interesting times and I hope that this presentation will help you make sense of them. Should you have any questions or queries, please don't hesitate to contact me or your AdviceWorks financial advisor. I hope you'll have a lovely day and a splendid weekend. Until next week, goodbye from me.